Dawson, Monster Rex, for Griff. Let's get straight into that. Spring had returned to the Kier Minches. Mornings could be a bit chilly, afternoons mild, and nights, well, if you were on a hillside camping or hunting, nights could be cold. Spring, a time of rebirth. This was my second spring in these mountains. I spent two winters here. I bought Slick Carl Green's trading post and had spent the first part of spring fortifying the post and building. I renamed the location Dawson's Crossing and was trying to turn it into a home that I could be proud of. This spring, it was no different. We were still building, only now Sherry was back. She no longer showed signs of Wendigo possession. And when that's not right, according to Henry Anglin, it was more of an oppression. Regardless, I wasn't challenging an educated man like Henry Anglin. He'd seen and had experienced a lot more of the world than I had. Still, Sherry had asked to travel back to the Lost Valley and allow both Scott and Lilith to continue to focus on keeping an unclean spirit of the Wenigo away. I'd send Lazy Eye Nixon with her to be my eyes and ears. Tim Grady, Slick and Trace Hooker were looking after things. I had given Trace instructions to add a watchtower to the barn, at least 30 feet high, built it of native stone, with living quarters for three to four in the bottom, and mount that gatling gun in the tower when it was completed. Tim had a large new house across from the main building. The front part was his office, one wing and two holding cells, and living quarters for both him and Olivia in the back. Slick took care of the overnight guests which might arrive unannounced, and everyone was expected to work the gardens, cut hay, and look after all of the animals. Olivia and Ari Hooker looked after the chickens, and helped Mike... Brenda and Amos in the kitchen. No one was allowed to go into the woods alone, not even into the Timberline. They all understood my reasons. Each of the grown men who worked for me at the crossing carried a forty five seventy rifle and wore a handgun, even a slick and a cook Amos. Brenda carried Arkansas Pete Derringer in her apron. I gave the Pete's pistol and gun belt to Mike. Trace carried a forty four forty Henry rifle. He felt comfortable with that and when the tower was completed, he'd be in charge of the Gatlin. My little out-of-the-way trading post was growing into a community. Finally, I had a home and a family, of sorts, and everything was shaping up to be a beautiful spring. My instincts should have warned me, regardless of what I believed or wanted to believe. It was a haunted trail I rode in life, and that realisation rose up and bit me in the ass later. Chapter 1 I rode slowly through the forest, listening to the squirrels barking at me, and watching Cottontails out running lone coyotes and a fox or two. I saw a flash of a mountain lion slink quietly through the brush as it stalked a yelling white-tailed buck. It wasn't troubling me, so I wouldn't trouble it, but I did take my forty five seventy out of its saddle boot, chamber around, and moved downwards where I saw a shadow brook run with clear, fresh, cold water. And it was a good place to strip my saddle, rub banjo, and the big grey mule down, lead them to water, and after they had their fill, take a drink myself. As I searched for the clearing, I wanted to camp in, and noticed the squirrels had stopped barking at me. Even the crows and the blue jays had stopped their harsh squawks and shrill calls. I figured the big cat or a bear might be in the area. I found a good spot to camp and climbed out of the saddle. I had a thought come to me. I should have brought Hooker's boy with me. He would have loved this. Chick had loved to fish in the shallow creek which flowed in front of the house in the Lost Valley. Ah, Chick. I had a thought about him since I sent Sherry off to Chicago to get help. Chick, who I took in to raise as a son, killed by a saber-toothed tiger. I tied Banjo and the mule, stripped the saddle and the supplies they carried, and then rubbed them down. I took the mule down to the stream to the water. He got his fill, and I took him back and gave him a bag of oats and led Banjo to the water. The big gelding drank his fill, and I repeated the process with him. And then, it was my turn. I grabbed my canteen and walked to the edge, dropped to my belly, and drank my fill. I then refilled my canteen. And then Banjo and the mule started making a fuss. And it was then that I began feeling that someone or something was watching me. I called to the animals and told them to quiet and down. I stood up and made sure I could draw my gun if I had to. And slowly... I began to turn my head and sweep the area. 
but there was no one around. Then I heard a huffing sound, which sounded like it was coming from across the stream. And slowly, I turned. Across the stream was a wild man, its mate and a young creature. The young one and the female were drinking the water. The huge male, huh, he was staring at me. And the creature stood nearly nine or ten feet tall, covered in dark brown hair. Its face, well, it resembled an ape's. Its head came to a conical shape. He must have weighed 800 pounds. And he stared at me and appeared to growl, upset that I was there. He was rocking side to side, showing me his teeth. I stood there looking at him. The female and the young one stood up and they too gave me the look over. The young one hooted at me. And I raised my right hand and a wave turned and walked back to the horse and mule. I heard a much deeper hoot and turned around and the big male raised its hand also turned, and then led his family up the stream. I built a small campfire that night and slept in the open. If anything was going to happen, the horse and the mule would raise the ruckus. I tried my luck fish in the stream the next morning. I had a line and I had some hooks. I was hoping for some perch or a nice catfish. But towards the late afternoon I heard a hooting sound. It sounded like the young wild man had gotten separated from its parents and was sending out a distressed call. I cleaned my fish and prepared them. I heard an earth-shattering roar followed by a frightened scream, and then silence. I'm not sure exactly what roared and what screamed, but I knew, in all probability, something had died. It wasn't far from me, so I broke my fishing camp, saddled Banjo, and loaded a mule's pack. And before climbing back into the saddle, I checked my rifle and pistol, and made sure that they were loaded, and mounted up, and then headed upstream. I rode warily, my rifle laying across the front of my saddle. I found a narrow spot in the stream and decided to cross over. The mule was acting a little stubborn about halfway across the stream, and that's when I noticed the trees were shaking violently. That's when I lifted a rifle from its spot laying across my saddle. I urged my horse to keep moving, and the mule, <laughs> well, it was a handful, but he did finally give in and followed. And the trees weren't shaking, but I could hear sounds of what might have been singing. I heard a few death chants before, and that's what this reminded me of. I reined up, tilted my hat back, lit a cigar, and listened. They are mourning the white man. I jerked around and saw as fine of a specimen of manhood that I'd ever seen, sitting on an Indian pony just across the stream, inside the trailer. Are you coming across? I asked. Yes. He nudged his pony across the stream, and then joined me. He wore a mixture of cattleman clothing and chotto garb. His long black hair was covered by a Confederate cavalry officer's hat. He noticed my gaze and smiled. I took it home. My father claimed he found it in these woods after you crazy white men stopped killing your brothers. Uh, not to sound better than you or anyone else, but your people fought for the Confederacy too. Yes, that is true. Oh, I am Swift. He extended his hand. I am Morgan Dawson. I shook hands and Swift looked me over and smiled. I have heard of you, Morgan Dawson. I thought you'd be much taller. And it was my turn. You said that was a death chant? Yes. One of the forest people has died. I've been in these damn hills to know what he was talking about when he mentioned forest people. I'd encountered three of them yesterday. I go to pay my respects. You will come with me? Yeah, sure. We'll ride together. I encountered three of them yesterday. Yes, the big male. It's mate and young one. My people moved to this valley in the late summer. We fish, hunt, and share with the family. In return, they protect us from the bad ones who used to prey upon my people and the people of other tribes who join us here. Oh, what's your think died, Swift? I asked as we rode through the timber. The young one. He reined his Indian pony up. In a small clearing sat the female holding what remained of her offspring. The big male was glaring at us and beating his chest with open palms. Swift bravely climbed off of his pony. He removed a beautiful blanket and spread it out in his arms, taking slow, measured steps, and then approached a the female, humming an unfamiliar tune. Now the female made no move of aggression. The big male watched him, and me, with caution. I lowered my rifle. Swift laid the blanket on the ground in front of the female, spread it, and using a sign, let her know. The blanket was to lay the young one's body in. 
the male ward to the female and took the remains from her arms and lay them on the blanket. The poor creature, huh, it had been ripped to shreds. It was missing a huge chunk from its side, one arm dangled broken and crushed. Uh, Swift, I said quietly, Yes, time to leave. He bowed his head and began stepping backwards to the horses. The male watched, probably suspicious of our presence. Swift climbed back on his pony and placed a hand over his heart. The big male looked and repeated the gesture. He locked eyes with me and held one of his massive hands up in a wave. It hadn't forgotten me, nor did I forget to return the gesture. Chapter 2 Now Swift remained with me as we rode through the darkening forest. There were no sounds at all. The chotter had placed an older sharps fifty caliber across the front of his saddle. He rode beside me on my left side and watched everything to our left. But he wasn't a talker. In fact, he didn't waste energy talking at all, not even a whisper. Once he raised his pony up and listened, he put his hand up to his right ear and cupped it. I did as he had, and you could vaguely hear something moving through the trees ahead of us. And Swift leaned over. Horses, uh, make out seven or eight. They move in the same direction we are. Outlaws, maybe. Hmm, maybe. I think they began looking for a camp soon. As should we, Morgan Dawson. I, I feel as if we are being watched. Uh, maybe from the bad ones? Hmm, something else. Okay, let's find somewhere to camp, somewhere we can defend. We rode away and found a shallow spring-fed brook. We let the horses and my mule drink their fill. Then we refilled our canteens. I had an extra and filled it also. I led off walking, leading the horse and the mule. Swift led his, and soon he saw an old rock overhang. Trees grew thick on both sides of the mature. Cedar tree grew almost in its entrance. We decided that that was going to have to serve us as our campsite. We moved up to it, carefully. I didn't want to surprise man or animal that might be using the overhang. It wasn't that deep, but deep enough for animals and men to camp unseen. I lit a lantern, drew my Colt forty-five, and walked into the cave. It probably had paid host to both men and animals over the years, but not in a long time. And Swift, I said as I came into the opening, Swift? I found the Chotos stabbing off into the forest, and I followed his gaze, but I didn't see anything. He slowly backed up towards the opening, leading the two horses and the mule. Morgan Dawson, please. He held out the reins of my two animals. I took possession of them, led them inside, and went back to the front of the overhang. Uh, what did you see, Swift? And still, he didn't speak. I reached down, took the reins of his pony. I turned, led it inside when I heard his sharps fire. I dropped the reins and found him backing into the shallow cave. What did you see, Swift? Your people call it a Nephilim. What? I grew up as a boy in northeast Texas, and with parents that were both decidedly Baptist. I grew up on Bible stories, and I heard my poor debate his friends many nights when neighbors would come by for a big feed and a party and stay all night. I had heard about the sons of God having their way with women of men. Their offspring were called the Nephilim. But angels would be good, wouldn't they? I'd asked through the years. My poor uncle told me, not if they had been fallen angels. Angels that had rebelled against God himself. That made them demons. And if Swift had seen one of these guys, which I doubted, he'd seen a non-typical Genosqua. And the Lord knew I hated them. Senor Rogers, did you hear that shot? Yes, Mr. Ross, I heard it. I was wondering if you government still wanted the ultimate weapon. You know, like Captain Wathan was hired to provide y'all with. Diego Rojas lit a long, slender cigar and poured himself a glass of wine. We want that gal in gone and any riches which might still be found at the site. But he paused and stroked his chin. If it were possible to capture such a creature and then train it, I'm sure my government would be generous. And Ross shifted his gun belt. Ah, uh, Senor Rojas, exactly how generous would that be? Ten thousand dollars each in gold, silver, women, 
beautiful, subservient Spanish women. Y'all planning on reclaiming Mexico? Yeah, Texas. The entire southwestern United States. Maybe you and your man would like to have land grants. Positions of power. Yeah, we'll do whatever needs to be done. Excellent, Mr. Russ. Now, how long until we arrive in this lost valley? We should be on the rim top by late tomorrow afternoon. Very well. Please, help yourself to a bottle of wine. And my thanks to you and your men. A lazy eye next and proudly outside of the cave, where Lilith was putting Sherry into a deep hypnotic sleep. This was what Miss Sherry had wanted, he told himself. To return to this damnable sight and have these two werewolves drive the Wendigo spirit completely out of her mind. She knew no one was safe as long as she could still feel its influence. The male werewolf Scott had told Lilith if he had to, he'd push himself into a trance and project his astral self into her brain and kill the spirit. Lilith had told him no, and there had been a big argument. They had treated both Sherry and himself well. Scott worked non-stop on rebuilding the house. Morgan had told him to help out as much as possible, but whenever they needed to be alone, well, stay out of their way. Hell, Lazy Eye thought. Wherever he went, one of those huge black wolves followed him. It didn't threaten him or Sherry. Whenever she walked to the stream with a fishing line, at least two of those critters escorted her. And she sat on the stump that lay down on either side of her. She didn't need me around except to talk after dark. And both knew Scott and Lilith were hunting, or just resting. He hoped Morgan might pay a visit, but Dawson Crescent was going to take up a lot of his time this spring. The sherry was in a big tent under some massive oak trees. Lazy I slept under the wagon he brought up with food and supplies, and tonight he lay quietly under the wagon, slowly falling asleep when he heard the most terrifying roar. He rolled out from under the wagon, his sharps fifty in hand, and Scott appeared out of the darkness in a half wolf form. Did you see anything, Nixon? He asked in his gravel-like voice. Nope. Sherry? And her voice came from the tent. I'm okay, Scott. What was it? I am not sure. I heard something similar, but that was... Well, it was before you were born. Lilith stepped out from the brush. She had wrapped herself in a cloak. I got a glimpse, and only a glimpse. It wasn't a Genosqua, Gugwe, Wendigo... Or anything else I'd ever seen or heard. I think it's something different, Scott. Said our friends on either side of the tent and Mr. Nixon's wagon. Neither go anywhere unescorted, Lilith. We gave our word. Morgan expects us to. We won't let him down. And Lilith disappeared back into the trees. It was a few minutes of silence and then the black walls began to appear. Soon Sherry and I were surrounded by them. They found places to lay down slept. Scott, who had returned to his human feature, grinned. I think, Lazy Eye, you will be disturbed tonight. And the men in Rojas's camp turned out quickly when the roar occurred. Ross began giving orders, mainly about protecting Rojas. Rojas stood in front of his tent in a red silk smoking jacket, a slim cigar in one hand and a silver goblet of wine in the other. Are you okay, senor? Asked Ross. See, si. Yes, I'm okay, Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross, why would you say made that roar? I'm going to guess that it was a really big good way or Janaskal, sir. Rojas nodded his head in agreement. And we have chains? Uh, yes, sir. Excellent. Capture this creature. You shall govern the entire American Southwest. Spain wants this creature. The gallon gun and the fortune believed to be in the Last Valley... They aren't important. Capture that monster, Rex. Chapter 3 I had built a small fire inside the cave and had left Swift to sleep. I figured he'd seen a really huge Genosqua, which some refer to as the Stone Giant or maybe a really big Gugwe. I didn't particularly like either creature, but the Gugwe scared the fire out of me. They looked wild and crazy. The only thing that was worse than a Wendigo I had absolutely no qualms about killing those things. Of course, the last one I knew, which had been killed, was the one Lilith killed. And if things went right, I planned on saying hello to Scott and Lilith very soon, not forgetting Sherry and Lazy Eye. In fact, 
I was going to send him off on a trip. I had with me an order for equipment to make a sawmill. If I was building a town, I needed lumber and nails. Lazy Eye would be sent to order and pick everything up. And I heard a slight movement behind me and Swift was standing there. I have never seen something so evil looking in my life, Morgan Dawson. Are you sure I wasn't some kind of mountain monster, Swift? I mean, these hills seem to be full of all kinds of strange beings. Or maybe a shapeshifter. We do not talk about such things like this, Morgan Dawson. If this is a new creature, we can't expect the Frost people to protect the Choctaw, the Cherokee, and others who leave the Highlands to protect us each winter. They will be defending themselves and their tribes. Then I guess we're on our own. I have a place. Yes, we know of it. Your people and the other tribes are welcome there. We'll defend and help each other. That is good. When we leave here, we will return to your people. Yeah, you can if you like. Tell them to come to the crossing. I'll give you a letter to give to Tim Grady. He will select a site for your villagers. You do not return. I have to visit friends who are helping my... Well, I was stuck. I never really asked Sherry to share my life. I guess I'd always assumed she'd always be with me. The woman you go to. She is your wife. Friend. Sister. Well, she is my friend for sure. Hopefully more. But I have to see her. Then when the sun rises, we must go to her. Well, she's in the Lost Valley. It is forbidden land for my people. Still, you are a brave man. And my friend. The forest people show you respect. Come, Morgan Dawson. We must leave. We were in the saddle within an hour. Swift wanted to look upon this creature's footprint, if he could find it, and I wanted to see it too. Our first stop was where Swift had seen the creature the afternoon before, when we found the overhang with the shallow cave. Swift reined up his pony, and there, on top of the fallen leaves, was a footprint of immense size. A barefoot, which easily was thirty inches long, Twenty inches across the ball of the foot, and eighteen inches across the heel of the foot. I didn't even want to estimate the weight of the thing. Its stride was better than twelve feet, and to my horror, it was headed to the Lost Valley. I looked at Swift, and he understood, and so we took off at a brisk walk. My horse banjo seemed to sense the urgency of our mission. I had to get to the Lost Valley. Scott, Lilith, and Lazy Eye would protect Sherry and each other, but they had no idea what was coming. Nor did we. Through a maze of old growth timber, we rode. I was in a hurry, and Swift pulled up and pointed. Lost Valley. Forbidden land. But for you, Morgan Dawson, I ride with you. We eased down off the ridgeline. I checked my pistol to see if it would come out easy of my holster, if needed. And my rifle was full. Swift continued to search the terrain on the left. I did the same on my right. And now to the grove of elm trees... They rode out and blocked our way. Whoa, boys. Where do you think you fellas are headed? This is private property. Yeah, I said. Belongs to me. And who might you be? Morgan Dawson. I bet you ain't got no deed to this land. Well, you'd be wrong. A fella named Scott left it to me. He looked familiar to me. Wouldn't be one of those dogs who ambushed me here once. Or with a traitor named Nathan Wartham, are you? Ah, gentlemen. I watched a man dressed in fine clothes, riding aside a beautiful white stallion, come from the back of the riders. He had in his hand what appeared to be a forty-five coat peacemaker, only it had ivory handle grips. Ah, gentlemen, let's not lose our heads. Who are you? I asked. Ah, I'm Diego Rojas, of His Majesty's. <laughs> Did you say Rojas? Any relation to Victor Rojas? The gunman? The undead Nosferatu Victor Rojas. Ah, you be careful, sir. That family does not speak of such things. You have met Victor? Ha, <laughs> I destroyed him. Gave him true peace. I saw the look in his eyes. This daddy had an ego. and was going to make a grandstand play. And so, I shot him before he could shoot or have me shot. Of course, I got the ball rolling and I emptied two more saddles before it came out of the trees. Or eighteen to twenty foot tall of him. It grabbed men off of their horses and bit them into pieces. Horses that had fallen, it grabbed and bit their heads off. I shouted a swift to ride. We put those horses into a run, 
I let go of the mule's lead, rope to give him a chance too. He brayed and took off. We ran at a curve on the trail, and there was Scott waving us in. I saw Lazy Eye squinting down the barrel of that shafts, and I knew this creature was coming. Lazy Eye fired, and by this, I was off with my rifle in hand. Shay was there firing a lever action. Scott and Lilith were fighting with guns. Both knew there was no hope of fighting this abomination in their wolfen forms. And the creature moved back into the trees, and things got quiet. Okay, what was that thing? Lazy Eye spat a stream of tobacco. Well, we know what it's not. It's not a werewolf. And part of me being blunt, but it's not a gugway. And it's not a genosqua. We don't fought those things, and it ain't no wendigo. I think it's a nephilim, a fallen angel's offspring. It's nature's evil. It possesses all the most evil attributes of all species. Can they be killed? I asked, and Scott shook his head. Not by any means I know of. Maybe if we have a cannon. Yeah, I said half aloud. Maybe if we had a cannon. We moved up to where the house had stood. The sherry was quiet. Earlier Yao said that maybe we could kill this master if we had a cannon. Lazy Eye spoke up and said, We ain't got no cannon, Miss Sherry. Before Wathen came, didn't he have some dynamite around to clear stumps? The Scott looked at me. That might do it. Have your chart off and rig up a bow. Make a few arrows. I did have some. Out in the old barn. Well, we need to check. It was dangerous stepping out from behind the walls, but Scott and I did it. Swift found what he needed for a bow and three pieces of wood he could fashion into arrows. I'm not sure where she found the twine, but Sherry found twine for the bow string. Scott and I found six sticks of dynamite and enough fuse to do the trick. We managed to get back to the protection of the walls and began putting things together. We put our bombs together and Swift, Scott, Lazy Eye and I stepped out onto the trail and began shouting. Sherry shouted that the top of the trees were moving. She said she thought that it was coming out. Trees parted and the monster emerged and roared. We had tied the dynamite to the end of the arrows. Scott turned and struck a match and lit a fuse at the end of the dynamite. He launched the first arrow. The dynamite exploded and the creature stumbled backwards. We had to hit him dead on for the dynamite to do any damage. Shoot again, Swift! shouted Lazy Eye. Another arrow was shot with the same results. I shoot the third. Don't light the fuse. I shoot the dynamite if you get it close to its neck or eyes. I swift shot again, and I drew my cold and fired as the arrow came close to the neck of the creature. The dynamite exploded, and the Nephilim grabbed at its throat. Blood poured from the wound. Swift fired his last arrow. It sailed high, and as it reached the throat area again, I fired again. The monster fell to its knees, a surprised look in its inhuman eyes. It groaned and crashed to the ground. Lilith and Sherry met us. I took Sherry in my arms. I think I want to cut my visit short, Morgan. I want to go home. Yeah, lazy eye. You and Swift want to come. We said a goodbye to Scott and Lilith. Yeah, come spend Christmas with us this year, Scott. We'll have to see, Morgan. We'll have to see. Then... We rode out to the Lost Valley, knowing some legends are true. Wow, 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 wow. Suddenly another one. Wow. Absolutely exhilarating, chest pounding, now biting action. Terror from the incredible mind of David Holly, exclusive to the DMT Forest of Fear channel. Big thank you, David, once again for letting us go back through this incredible collection of yours. I really do hope you're enjoying this as much as I am as we revisit the good times and the adventures of the Hostile Intent series. Well, guys and girls, as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Well, it really does help with the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now if you can pen a story packing that much punch, 
then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. As always, guys and girls, I hope you're well and happy and taking a fight back to life and trying to stay fit and focused. But above all, remember, be safe, not sorry.